at a small day. That's uh, very that's cool. cool. Um, and they are old school. Um, to women have to have head covers. Oh, it's not like that. Not, it's not like that at all. Uh, they have the skirts have to be literally almost down to the sole of the shoe. They can really, I mean, they are very conservative in that. Guys, small sleeves. They have tattoos. Don't show your tattoos. It was very strict dress code. But yeah, all these monasteries, you're visiting this home. That's what we were yesterday, right? So, you know, that in mind. I've got a bunch of masks for all of my friends. Oh, yeah, right. Um, it's very warm. Oh, yeah, right. I went out for a few minutes. I went out for a few minutes. I went out for a few minutes. I stayed out there with Brian. Um, yeah, I went hiking. Yeah, that's a good one. But it's warm. I don't know if I can do it for three months out of the year. And there's and a good news. No ah, I was hoping yeah. actually. Yeah. 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 DAW, some people are um, asking what policies you work with in their they live in the summer months without an oven. Yeah, black leather steering wheel. Oh, yeah, it's like that. It is open, they wear gloves. <laughs> oh, All right, I think we're gonna begin. Oh. So, let us uh, uh, before we start with a prayer, <laughs> before we start with a prayer, I'll just uh, I want to kind of give some uh, basic introductory remarks here. Um, so welcome, uh, blessed Great Lent to all of you. I hope you've had a good start, a good beginning to Great Lent. Uh, we just started Great Lent uh, a week ago, um, last clean Monday, and um, we just celebrated the first uh Sunday of Great Lent, which we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, and um, so basically, what we're going to be doing. Uh, essentially, for the next uh, five to seven or so weeks, we're going to be doing essentially this reflections for Great Lent, um, which is uh, pr primarily we're going to be focusing our, uh, our our narrow or narrowing our focus mostly on the weekly themes of Great Lent uh, that are presented every Sunday. And um, oftentimes we talk about Great Lent as a journey to Easter or to Pascha. And so there's all these Sundays that have a certain theme. Uh, and so we're talking tonight about the triumph of Orthodoxy. Next week is St. Gregory Palamas. The third week will be the Sunday of the Cross. The following week after that is going to be actually a combination of St. John Climacus and St. Mary of Egypt. We're going to watch a movie uh, on two movies on their life. And then the, the last week we're going to watch or the last week we're going to talk about um, the days of Holy Week and Pascha. And then the following week after that will be Pascha. So obviously it will not be a uh, class because it will be Holy Week. Um, this PowerPoint, I will email it to you guys. You can check out all these little nice little details of each Sunday. Uh, kind of give a short little summary on that. Uh, but today, this is our focus for tonight. The first Great Lenten Sunday, which is called the Triumph of Orthodoxy. So let us go ahead and stand for a prayer. This is the Tuparian or the Apolitikian. Uh, of the feast. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Christ our God, begging forgiveness of our sins, we venerate your pure image, O good one. Of your own will, you condescended to ascend upon the cross in the flesh and delivered those you created from the bondage of the enemy. Wherefore, thankfully, we cry out when you come, when you came to save the world, you filled all things with joy, O our Savior. Amen. All right, please be seated. And we will begin with this. We will begin with this nice little video. And we will proceed. All right. Uh, that. Here we go. It is the 
first Sunday of Lent. At the end of the Divine Liturgy, the people of the Church, clergy and laity alike, line up in a procession, holding icons of all different types and sizes. They travel around the church or the city, singing triumphant hymns and prayers. Even without knowing the reasons behind this event, one gets the sense that the first Sunday of Lent is a joyous occasion. To many people outside of the Orthodox Church, icons are a foreign, perhaps even blasphemous thing. To the Orthodox, however, they are an important tradition, one that was nearly erased from the Church doctrine in the year 726 A.D. In that year, Emperor Leo III demanded that icons be removed from the city of Constantinople. This began the split within the Byzantine Empire between the iconoclasts, or the destroyers of icons, and the iconophiles, or the friends of the icons. These titles were more than just names. Records state that the iconoclasts really did invade the churches and destroy icons on behalf of their beliefs. Some iconoclastic emperors even went so far as to torture citizens who were found hiding icons. This intense division between Christians eventually brought about the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which dealt primarily with the controversy surrounding holy icons. The council was implemented in 787 AD under Empress Irene and Patriarch Tarasios of Constantinople. Turning in favor of the icons, the council agreed upon a doctrine that specified that icons should be venerated but not worshipped. This decision silenced the iconoclasts who believed icons were heretical. The decree created by the council states, We define that the holy icons should be exhibited in the holy churches of God, on the sacred vessels and liturgical vestments, on the walls, furnishings, and in houses and along the roads. We define also that they should be kissed and that they are an object of veneration and honor, but not of real worship which is reserved for him who is the subject of our faith and is proper for the divine nature. He who venerates the icon venerates in it the reality for which it stands. It was not until 843 AD, however, that the icons were officially restored to the churches. It is because of this event that the Orthodox Church has a day to remember the triumph of the true faith against the iconoclasts. The remembrance of the final restoration of the holy icons takes place on the first Sunday of Great Lent and is celebrated with a procession of icons. It is known as the Sunday of Orthodoxy because the icons give us a chance to proclaim our faith in Christ as God and man both in words as well as in images. As we see, as the teachers have been given, as the world has agreed, as grace has shown forth, as truth has been revealed, as falsehood has been dispelled, as wisdom has become manifest, as Christ awarded thus we declare, thus we affirm, thus we proclaim Christ our true God, and honor his saints in words, writings, thoughts, sacrifices, churches, and holy icons. On the one hand, worshiping and ever enhancing Christ as God and Lord, and on the other, honoring honoring the saints as true servants of the same Lord of all, and offering them proper veneration. This is the faith of the apostles. This is the faith of the fathers. This is the faith of the Orthodox. This is the faith on which the world is established. Therefore, with fraternal and filial love, we praise the heralds of the faith, those who with glory and honor have struggled for the faith. And we say to the champions of Orthodoxy, faithful emperors, most holy patriarchs, hierarchs, teachers, martyrs, and confessors, may your memory be eternal. All right, so um, let us read this together. So this uh, handout I, I gave to you, we're going to, I wrote this for us tonight. Um, we're going to read through it as much as we can tonight. And um, uh, so kind of following on, we, we just did the prayer. Now we're going to look at the uh, historical and spiritual background of the feast. We just watched the video. 
But here we have this nice little synopsis given by Metropolitan College to swear. And uh, yeah, he's very good. Uh, I, I like him very much. So this uh, particular feast is called the Triumph of Orthodoxy, and it's also called the the uh, Sunday of Orthodoxy. Um, so here is what Metropolitan College says. On this day, the church commemorates the final, the finding no, the final ending of the iconoclast controversy and the definitive restoration of the icons to the churches under Empress Theodora on the first Sunday, Great Lent, March 843. So it continues to be celebrated uh, every Sunday of the uh, first Sunday of Great Lent. A special service is held at the end of Orthros or more commonly at the end of the L Divine Liturgy. The service celebrates not only the restoration of the holy icons, but more generally the victory of the true faith over all heresies and errors. A procession is made with the holy icons, and after this, extracts are read from the synodical decree of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Then anathemas are pronounced against various heretics. Eternal memory is sung in honor of the emperors, patriarchs, and fathers who defended the Orthodox faith. Um, and many years is proclaimed in honor of our present rulers and bishops. Unfortunately, in many parts of the Orthodox Church today, this impressive service has fallen into disuse. Elsewhere, it is performed in a greatly abbreviated form. He continues. <laughs> now the spiritual dimension of the feast. There is, however, not only a historical link between the first Sunday and the restoration of the icons, but also a spiritual connection. If orthodoxy triumphed in the era of the iconoclastic controversy, this was because so many of the faithful were prepared to undergo exile, torture, and even death for the sake of the truth. The Feast of Orthodoxy is above all a celebration in honor of the martyrs and confessors who struggled and suffered for the faith. Hence, it's appropriateness for the season of Lent. When we are striving to imitate the martyrs by means of our own ascetic self-denial, the fixing of the triumph of orthodoxy on the first Sunday is therefore much more than the result of some chance historical event. So these uh, martyrs and confessors are great uh, examples for us to look up to, to be inspired by, uh, just as they denied themselves in order uh, when they were being persecuted, just as they denied themselves and um, chose death rather than compromise the truth, so too we are called to live a life of self-denial even more during Great Lent as we are persecuted by the demons, right? Temptations. So here I wrote this little short snippet from a sermon I gave a few months ago. We may not be persecuted for our Orthodox faith nowadays, but we do face a kind of spiritual martyrdom or persecution by the demons every day when they attack us with temptations. Therefore, we are called to be martyrs in the spiritual sense by waging warfare against the demons, which we are striving to do even more of during Great Lent to prepare for Pascha. So there is your historical and um, spiritual kind of dimension to the feast. Now, moving on to our uh, our handout for today. All right, can I please have someone to read now this next little section here, today's interrelated topics. You guys have the handout in front of you. Today's interrelated topics, why we will learn about them. All right, everything we're gonna be learning about tonight, uh, as you're gonna see in the next few pages, why we're going to talk about all this. Cody, would you do us the honors? Thank you. Uh, today's interrelated topics, why we, sorry, why, why, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Type of. We will learn about the heresy of iconoclasm attacked the church at two different time periods or waves. The first wave took place between 726 to 787 AD, and the second occurred between 814 to 80, 842 AD. The church's first official and universal response to iconoclasm was expressed at the Seventh Ecumenical Council in 787 AD. The second official and universal response to the entire church to iconoclasm was in 843 AD. 
which we celebrate on the first Sunday of Great Lent. Hence, it is called the Triumph of Orthodoxy, or Sunday of Orthodoxy. On this special feast day, Orthodox parishes typically only read a few small extracts from the Seventh Ecumenical Council's uh, synod synodical decree, also called the synod Synodicum of Orthodoxy. The full Synodicum was further expanded at the Ninth Ecumenical Council, and in its fullness contains one anathemas against various heretics and heresies, as well as joyfully proclaiming many years of memory eternal to those who defended the Orthodox faith against heresies. So, as we can see, the triumph of orthodoxy touches upon many interrelated topics, the nature of counsel, the authority of bishops, uh, presuppositions for obedience, and the danger of heresy. With these in mind, it is appropriate, especially for us today, to brush up our understanding of these topics, because many Orthodox Christians, including clergy, have lost a true Orthodox chronomia, mindset, attitude, due to falling under the influence of secular revitalism and Westernization. It appears that the ultimate intent of promoting erroneous understandings of these topics by false teachers and prophets in the name of Orthodoxy is to incrementally lead the faithful to be more susceptible to embracing the apparently imminent false union with Roman Catholicism, and perhaps other religions too, which like in the 15th century at the false union of Florence is not a unity based on the heterodox uh, repenting of their heresies and embrace, embracing truth, but sadly, a unity based on the orthodox compromising theory. <laughs> so if we are to avoid being deceived by contemporary delusions, and more importantly, we are to remain faithful followers of the Holy Fathers, we must continuously be studying the teachings of the church as passed down to us by the choir of the Holy Fathers. At the end of the day, we shall see at a deeper level how the triumph of orthodoxy and all of those interrelated topics connect to the celebration of Pascha and our salvation in general. Therefore, let us proceed onwards. All right, so we will begin now going forward. I'm going to actually just make this into one. All right. Travis, if, yes. If you do get something published, yeah, I'll do your audio book for you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah. Who did from that time or before that time? What what who was considered a heretic and what so uh we actually will talk about that a little bit towards the end of this, actually. So let's let's wait for that. If maybe if it's not as clear, then I'll answer. I'll, I'll hash it out a little bit more. Actually, today uh, at Malone, we uh, this morning we talked about sick, Second Timothy, and uh, Saint Paul in in that letter, as well as in, in other letters, talks about the uh, puts a lot of emphasis on holding on to holy tradition and contrasting it with heresy. Um, and so we did a really fun activity today. We I split the students up into uh, two groups, and one group looked at St. Paul's uh, writings about um, about holy tradition, and uh, the other group looked at the writings of St. Paul and other church fathers of what he says about heresy. And we kind of showed why St. Paul emphasizes again and again and again the importance of holding on to holy tradition uh, and its relationship with uh, heresy and whatnot. So it was a very fun. I, I enjoyed that kind of new format today. So uh, yeah, well, there's a section about heresy in here. So we'll get to that in a second. They arrive at any conclusion. I'm oh, sorry. Did they arrive? At oh yeah, they they. I was very impressed with them. I was very happy. Um, basically, I gave them these little extracts and I told them, uh, you know, go and look for what Saint Paul is trying to say based off of his words, and they all hit the nail on the head. Uh, today, so I was very happy with that. Yeah, thank God. All right, our next section, Orthodox Ecclesiology 101. I'm going to get rid of this and um, can I have another reader to go ahead and read uh, this next section for us. You want to? Yeah, please. Nice and loud because uh, we're recording this and we put it on YouTube. So uh, those who are going to watch the recording, that way they can hear it. All right. The church's governance is expressed primarily through councils, also called synods, 
The first council of the church is recorded in Acts 15, which was attended by the apostles themselves at Jerusalem in 48 AD. Hence, it's commonly called the Apostolic Council. The apostles who were the first bishops of the church gathered together to decide how much of the Mosaic law Gentile converts had to observe. In Robert Spencer's book, The Church and the Codes, he observed some fascinating features of this council, which are very important for properly understanding Orthodox theology. When St. Peter offers his opinion on the issue, it is not treated as the final say-so or decision for the church. The other apostles still spoke and offered their views and tried coming to an agreed decision with one another. In other words, the apostles did not recognize nor treat St. Peter as some sort of infallible pope with supreme authority. They saw him as a bishop with equal authority as they themselves were. All the apostles, including St. Peter, <clears throat> agreed with St. James' viewpoint and his wishes are immediately carried out. The disciples draft a letter to call all Christians of the church, announcing the apostles' decision. As St. James and not St. Peter had directed them to do so, the letter is signed as coming not from a single individual with supreme and valuable authority, but rather from all the apostles in the decision of the council. It started as having been made not by a single individual with supreme and valuable authority, but rather had been made by a collective body of bishops with equal authority who made the decision in mutual agreement consensus together. The apostles proclaimed that their decision at the council had been made under the divine inspiration and guidance of God, the Holy Spirit himself, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, from Acts 15, 28. In other words, the council's decision was infallible, that is, without error, because through the cooperative synergy of the apostles, the Holy Spirit guided and enlightened them to make such an infallible decision. Whenever a serious issue faced the entire church and not just some small region or metropolis, she confronted it as just like the apostles did. By bishops of the church <clears throat> meeting in a council, these particular councils with the universal or worldwide characteristics are called ecumenical councils. As was the case with the apostles, there is zero evidence going throughout history even before the great schism of 1054 AD, that the church appealed to a single bishop with infallible authority to make decisions for the entire church. The church from its very inception has always been consular in nature, not monarchical. For a further analysis of this, see the resources mentioned. Thank you. So in case you're interested, uh, I have the book here, The Church and the Pope. Feel free to check that out. He goes through the entire history of the church and presents the um, uh, the original sources for themselves and how uh, the Christians treated the Bishop of Rome and um, how they addressed him, how they talked to him, how he acted. And he demonstrates from the original sources themselves that uh, Rome's bishop never really acted as some sort of infallible pope. So very good uh, book. Feel free to check that out. Uh, and there's other resources in that footnote you can check out as well. Some nice uh, articles and videos and so forth that talk about that more in depth. All right. So now moving on to look at the ecumenical councils themselves, right? So you'll recall that the first time the church responded to iconoclasm was actually at the Seventh Ecumenical Council. That's when the church gave its its official proclamation uh, it was at the Seventh Ecumenical Council saying, yes, we can have and use icons uh, in our worship. Um, and, um, and so it would be good for us to look at very briefly at the nine ecumenical councils. There are nine and we're gonna show that in just a second. Um, and that's going to be important for talking about other things uh, tonight. So um, let us, I have this on the PowerPoint uh, here. And so I will uh, pop that up for us right now. All right. We're going to go very quickly through these nine ecumenical councils. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> the first ecumenical council took place in Nicaea. 325 AD, at this council, the Holy Fathers wrote the first half of our creed, right? I believe in one God, 
the first half was written and the Holy Fathers anathematized the heresy of Arianism. Arianism taught, uh, was actually taught by a priest of the church, Arius, and he taught that Jesus is a creature, that he is not God. Well, the church said that's a heresy. Jesus is God and he is consubstantial or one essence with uh, the Father and the Holy Spirit. The second ecumenical council was in Constantinople in 381 AD. The Holy Fathers wrote the second half of our creed and they anathematized the pneumatomachi, which literally means spirit fighters, those people who taught that the Holy Spirit is a creature and not the creator. The church said, yes, the Holy Spirit is the creator. He is one in essence with the Father and the Son and to be worshiped as God. Uh, so that was took place at the Second Ecumenical Council. The Third Ecumenical Council took place in Ephesus 431 AD, condemned the heresy of Nestorianism. You'll notice that many of these heresies are named after their creators, right? So Arianism was created by Arius, who was a priest of the church, interesting. Uh, Nestorius was a patriarch. He was the patriarch of Constantinople. He taught this heresy called Nestorianism. And basically this heresy taught that God the Logos, okay, God the Logos is a individual and God the Logos came to dwell inside of Jesus the man or Christ the man. So you have two different per people. God the Logos coming and dwelling inside of Jesus the man. Um, and therefore, Nestorius taught that the Virgin Mary is to be called Christotokos and not Theotokos because he said, well, look, Jesus is just a man. So she just gave birth to Jesus the man or Christ the man. Therefore, she should be called the birth giver of Christ, Christotokos and not Theotokos. So this was condemned as a heresy and the church especially according to the teachings of St. Cyril of Alexandria, a very, very important church father. As you see on the icon on the right, he said, no, 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 no. Jesus has two natures, divine and human, existing within a single person, right? So this is what took place there. The Fourth Ecumenical Council took place in Chalcedon in 451 AD and condemned the heresy of monophysitism, the teaching that Jesus only has one nature. That's what the term monophysitism means. It's a Greek term, Ma mono, meaning one, physitism or feces, nature, so one nature. This was condemned as a heresy, and the church teaches that Christ has two natures, divine and human. He is both God and man. The Fifth Ecumenical Council took place in Constantinople in the year 553 AD, it condemned several heresies. One heresy was the heresy of origin. He was uh, uh, a prolific author, writer in the church origin. He, however, taught the heresy that our souls pre-existed, that our souls pre-existed before coming uh, and, and dwelling in our bodies. That's a heresy. Uh, we believe as Orthodox Christians that the soul and the body are created simultaneously at the same time. The soul does not pre-exist before the formation of the body. And uh, another heresy it condemned was this idea that the body will not be resurrected. That also is a heresy. We believe that the body will be resurrected and it will be transformed and be made more spiritual. Uh, and it will not be subject to corruption and decay and death and all the rest. That will be done away with at the end of time when Christ returns. Um, and at this Fifth Ecumenical Council, it also doubled down on the previous Ecumenical Council's teaching about the two natures of Christ. The Sixth Ecumenical Council took place in Constantinople, 680 or 681 AD, and it condemned the heresy of monothelitism, the idea that Jesus only has one will, that is a heresy, uh, Jesus has two natures, therefore he has two wills, a divine and human will, and that the human will was continuously in synergy and obedience to the divine will and works in sync with it. Um, and uh, one of the most prolific writers of that era was St. Maximus the Confessor. Uh, he hashed out that whole theology for us extensively more than anyone else. 
Uh, and at Holy Trinity, our Holy Trinity Parish on Fairhaven, we have a very small relic of St. Maximus the Confessor. The Seventh Ecumenical Council took place in Nicaea, 787 AD, condemned the heresy of iconoclasm, the idea that icons are not to be used in churches. That is a heresy. The church says, yes, we can use icons. Uh, and this is um, this was a, a, a practice that God himself revealed to us. We're going to look at that in a second. All right. Before we go on, any questions or comments? Um, Pope Pius III, when he was the Oriental Orthodox and the Catholics walked out, they were... The fourth. That's not the fourth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so... <clears throat> Hey, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, and another really interesting to note very quickly about this council, as you see in this icon, is that the Holy Fathers, in order to prove that their theology was correct, what they did was they took the Orthodox teaching, they wrote it up in a pamphlet or scroll. They went to the tomb of Saint Ephemia. She was a martyr of the church. They opened up her casket or her tomb. They put... Uh, their confession of faith in the tomb, all right, uh, laid it on her body. And the Monophysites, they also wrote up their confession of faith and they put it in the casket. They closed the casket. They, they went their separate ways. They all prayed and they fasted for three days. On the third day, they came back to the tomb of St. Ephemia. They opened up the casket. And what do they find? Does anyone know this story? What they find is that miraculously, St. Ephemia is holding up the Orthodox confession of faith in her right hand, like this. And the Monophysite, the, the confession of faith of the Monophysites is being trampled on her, uh, underneath her feet. So this is yet another, yes, this is another, yeah. <laughs> yeah so That's yeah thank god so it's uh that is uh what you see in that icon being depicted so that's a, yet another proof that uh, of uh of our doctrine being uh you know taught by the holy spirit yes fourth ecumenical council in in uh chalcedon 451 yeah did you have another question yes please Mm -hmm. uh, was the heresy of origin that the soul didn't pre exist or it did pre exist? It did. It did. He, he says it did pre exist. Mm -hmm. And the church condemned that as a heresy. Yeah. Well, that's what the ancient Greek philosophers taught. Uh, and it's because the soul, as I said earlier, the soul and the body come into existence at the same time. The soul does not come into existence before the body. It comes together at the same time at conception. Uh, saying what? Hey. The Holy Fathers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I could look at, I, I know where they're, I could get for you uh the text their writings that talk about that but we don't need a we don't need a council to formulate our theology or anything like that we we can go straight to the holy fathers so there's this there's actually i wrote a paper on this one time um we do not need um we do not need uh we do not need councils to uh, to tell us exactly what we believe for it to be accepted by the church. Um, there's many sources from where our theology can be found in the hymnography, the iconography of the church, the gospels, uh, the canons, um, you know, ancient Christian literature, conciliar decrees, right? So it's not just within the councils. It can be in other sources, such as the writings of the Holy Fathers. Um, I personally don't know if there's any councils out there that talked more about that other than the Fifth Ecumenical Council. Uh, but I do know for a fact that there are many fathers that talk about, you know, kind of our anthropology. Um, if you'd be interested, uh, 
look at that more. I'll, I'll gather up some sources for you. Where did it all start? Yeah. Well, if you start at Genesis, mm -hmm. I was thinking when you start at Genesis, right? It says that God did into Adam and Eve. That's where it starts. Mm -hmm. He didn't breathe life into all of us. That's when he created everything. He's the only humans he created and the only, as far as breathing life into something, was Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I'm happy. I'm happy you mentioned that because I, now I'm recalling in Father Seraphim Rose's uh, book called Genesis Creation and Early Man. It's out of print currently, um, but the second edition, revised version, much larger. He offers a commentary on the six seven days of creation, and um, in there he has commentaries from the Holy Fathers talking about when it says that God breathed into Adam and Eve looking at the commentaries of the fathers what does that mean some say that it meant that the soul and the body were being formed at that moment others say that it was the holy spirit being infused into adam and eve uh but yes i do know for a fact that this is our theology that the, the body and the soul come together they, they are created at the same exact time yeah I'll, i will uh, put some things together for you i'll share with all you guys by email to hash that out more in detail yeah yeah. So to some degree, we could we could assume that baby's first breath is the soul as it as it emerges from the womb. Um. This or is this is uh. It's conjecture. Well, this this is uh it, 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 the um you know us breathing oxygen. This is evidence that the soul is in our body because the soul animates the body. And gives life to the body that's why when a person dies it means that their soul has left their body it's been separated from their body okay so soul and the fetus yes okay mm -hmm. yeah, okay. yeah. at the at the moment of conception yeah um, another thing origin wasn't he kind of on the fence in other words brilliant some of his writings were oh yes that. And, and that that is the 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 beauty uh father from of alaska he writes uh, has a whole section uh in his book about monastic orthodox monasticism uh he, and in the back of the book he has a, a fantastic chapter there titled mm -hmm. uh the benefits uh to the writings of the heterodox and so what's interesting is that uh kind of like saint basil the great says be the bee right find the good in everything Right and and disregard what is bad. So, Origen, for example, even though he was condemned as a heretic by the Ecumenical Council, we don't throw the how you say that saying. We, yeah, right. So there's a lot of great material that he wrote. Um, so we can you know kind of borrow from that, I suppose, right? Um, but we just have to be careful with you know, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. All right, so let us move on. All right, so let us for a second simmer, <laughs> simmer in this uh, topic about icons, right? What we're talking about just uh, two days ago. Sunday of Orthodoxy, iconoclasm, all the rest, triumph of Orthodoxy over uh, uh, iconoclasm. So where do we get our iconography? If you want to look more extensively at the biblical basis, evidence of our use of icons, this is the book to get, uh, The Truth of Her Faith. This is a very good book. Talks. This is Elder Cleopa giving numerous, numerous, numerous uh, biblical citations for all of our beliefs and practices of the Christian faith. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, he's talking to Protestants and, uh, and so forth. So anyways, I only have a few here, but um iconography this is not man-made it's not something we just invented uh this is something that god himself instituted so if you go to these chapters here exodus chapters 5 25 26 first kings chapter 6 first chronicles chapter 3 ezekiel ch chapter 41 um god himself okay god himself commands that the jews create icons icons depicting angels for instance um holy tradition of the jewish religion if you look up if you just do a simple google search you're going to find that um if you look up jewish synagogues you're going to see from top to bottom they're covered with icons showing scenes from the old testament the prophets all of that 
uh, earliest Christian catacombs, no different. Top to bottom, filled with iconography. Um, so God himself institutes this. This is part of holy tradition. Uh, this is, you know, very biblically based. Um, we uh, There's the uh, icon called Not Made by Hands. It's just another example uh, where we get iconography. Um, King Abgar or something like this, he had leprosy, lived around the same time as Christ. And he sent one of his, uh, one of his uh, people to Christ and said, you know, bring Christ here so he can come and heal me. So the, the person goes to Christ and, and tells him the king wants to see you. He's sick. He needs to be healed. And Christ takes a towel and he wipes his own face with this towel. And miraculously, Christ's face is printed on this towel. And this is called the icon not made by hands because no one made it with their own hands. And he sends it back with the servant. The servant gives it to the to the king and he's healed of his leprosy. That's another uh, tradition. St. Luke, the evangelist who wrote the Gospel of Luke, he was an iconographer. The very first icons we have of Christ and Panagia were made by him. And they still exist to this day. They can be found on Mount Athos. You can look that up more to see what they look like, what monasteries they are, where they are at performed many miracles. Another thing I read from uh, the great Synaxidesis collection, but a week ago about the Sunday of Orthodoxy, um, the apostles, I forget which two, uh, they were sent and they went to go create uh, a Christian temple, church building, and they took one of the pillars in this church building and they drew an icon of the Virgin Mary. And when the Virgin Mary came to visit this church, she was very impressed and, and was very happy to see this icon of her in this in this temple and, and so forth. So there's many, many stories we could talk about, but um, you know, there's many things we gotta talk about tonight. So uh, if you want to talk more extensively about that, we could do that later on. But this is kind of the biblical basis, the historical basis of it. Um another thing, kind of like the Muslims, right? They say, why are you depicting God, right? God's, you know, no one's seen God. Well, the thing is, is that Christ became man, right? God became man. So of course we could depict God, right? We can depict God, the son, Jesus Christ. So since he became visible, we can therefore depict him, right? God, the son, Jesus Christ. This is why it's incorrect to depict God, the father in icons. Sometimes you perhaps have seen this icon from time to time. That's really not okay because no man has seen the father as Christ says. Yeah. I'm on the Father, mm -hmm. kind of like a Holy Trinity, the icon, the, the, the blue yeah. light or something coming down. Yeah. Is that, that's a proper depiction yeah. of the Father. That would be the 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 furthest that we could go. That's the limit. Yeah, that's really the limit. Kind of like a theophany, like I think you just said is, you know, the clouds open up and the Father speaks, right? Uh, Mount Tabor, right? Matthew chapter 17. The same thing the father speaks right but that's the furthest we can go in and in regards to the holy spirit the furthest i think we can go is depicting the holy spirit in the form or likeness of a dove just as he revealed himself in the likeness or in the form of a dove at christ's baptism right um or the cloud at mount tabor right so uh these are kind of the tradition that we've received so um, and then, you know, in terms of the saints, right, we have the halo, the gold background to show that they are participating in God's glory, right? Um, as Christ says to the Father, John's, John's gospel, uh, I have given them my, your glory, right? They share, the saints share in the glory of God. We're all called to uh, participate in God's glory, in his light, right? Now, another thing is a distinction we make between veneration and worship, right? We, when we kiss an icon, let's say an icon of an angel or a saint, our act of veneration, respect and honor passes on to the saint or the angel. And if we kiss an icon of the Holy Trinity or Christ, we, that act of worship alone goes to God. So we make that very important distinction that we do not worship the saints. We do not worship even the wood of the icon, right? And we're not even, we, we in a sense, we show respect to the icon itself, but that's not really the point. The point is that our respect or our worship 
passes on to the prototype. It passes on to the person that we are, you know, interacting with. So this is why we say icons are like windows into heaven. Through the icons, they are like spiritual portals through which we can actually participate and encounter those who are depicted, right? They are they are these windows into heaven or they're portals uh, or conduits through which we can actually have a real uh, relationship with, uh, with Christ, his saints, and the angels. Another thing is that when we venerate the icon or when we venerate the icons, when we're engaging with them because uh, of the the name, because of the name, uh, my Pet my petrology professor, a monk from Manatos taught me this. Uh, he said that the reason why icons are holy is because the name of Christ or the name of the saints or the names of the angels makes them holy. So the, it's the name that sanctifies the entire icon um, in addition to the image of the one depicted, right? Which is why, and I can send you an article that talks about this, it's really not exactly appropriate or at least theologically correct to be doing this common custom that you sometimes see in parishes where we're taking our icons and we're saying, Father, can you bless this for 40 days? The icons don't necessarily need to be blessed for 40 days because they're already blessed by having the name and the image of those depicted on the icon. Um, and so that's there's an article that hashes that out much more in detail. If you want to see that, I'll, I will send that your way. But again, it's just not really necessary. Um, and if we take it a little too far, it could be kind of borderline heretical because it's a denial of our theology concerning the the sanctity, how they're sanctified through the name and the image depicted thereon. So that's just another thing. And also when we, if I didn't mention this, forgive me, when we engage with the icons, we ourselves receive the grace of God. We, we, we are sanctified. We are blessed as we participate in the icons. So this is why um, this is why so much care is taken towards the icons. Uh, and finally, another theological point I want to make about icons, uh, which has unfortunately become slightly forgotten in recent years, is that the way we engage with icons is not merely bowing to them. We kiss them. We physically kiss them. Uh, this is what the word proskinal or veneration means, is to literally um, to kiss longingly or to kiss uh fervently this is the the kind of what's the word semantics semantics yeah uh, uh, in the etymology of the of the term so we kiss physically kiss the icons and to show just how serious it is to not kiss the icons the seventh ecumenical council several times says anathema to those who do not kiss the icons so physical interaction with the icons is very very important it's not something to mess around with um that's just another thing i wanted to clarify concerning our theology about iconography all right there's some we're not going to watch all these videos again i'm going to send this powerpoint your way you can watch the rest on your own some of these are just short little clips so we're going to take a look at them all right why is venerating an icon not worshiping an icon or the saint Christ became man. He dwelt among us. He revealed himself to us. And in each of those who become like him, they go from the image and likeness, his image is shown forth. And when we venerate that image, whether it be Christ, the mother of God, or the saints, we're venerating the prototype. All the veneration, the love, the devotion goes to God. Not a piece of wood, not paint, and not even a human being, but a divine humanity. And this is a confirmation of the incarnation, a confession of the faith that he is among us. And we do this on a human level with our own photographs. We kiss a photograph of a beloved that's far away. How much more should we show love and devotion to God who became man for our sake? There's another one. 
Why does the Orthodox Church have icons? The short answer is because God became man. He became a touchable human being. He can be depicted. Our worship, we participate in him, both in soul and body, so that we can kiss the icon and interact with the one depicted with our body. We also value beauty for our salvation. And so we adorn the things that we love. We decorate our entire churches, not just merely for aesthetic decoration, but for that experience of both body and soul in our worship experience. Why does the Orthodox Church have icons? So in our worship in the Divine Liturgy, there are times when we're venerating the icons that are in our churches. And one of the ways that we do that is we'll make the sign of the cross and we'll just give it a little bow and a small kiss. That whole motion is to be understood as going directly to the person depicted or as a way of participating in the event. So if you look up here, you see this great big arch. There are two icons being depicted, two events being depicted in these icons. The top uh, being the Annunciation, the Archangel Gabriel coming to visit the Mother of God uh, and telling her about the coming of Christ and that she will be the bearer of, of God. Below that, the event of Pentecost uh, as recorded in the Book of Acts, you can see the tongues of fire descending on each one. And so when we bow to these icons, when we venerate them, we're participating in that event. So in our... The iconography is really meant to do a lot of the teaching that we can't do through our words. And what people will see when they look at icons of someone, well, what they ought to see is Christ shining through that person. This is part of why they have a halo. This halo is not something that they earned or something that through hard work they were given as an honorific of some kind. The reason we call someone a saint to begin with is because they lived a holy life, which is to reflect Christ to the person they're standing in front of. We have many icons behind us here, the Mother of God being one. Saint John of San Francisco is a patron of our church here. If you were to be able to speak to Saint John today, and we've heard this from people who have known him and who did know him, you would feel as though you were speaking to Christ himself. That's how we know someone's a saint. If we speak to someone or we interact with them and it feels like we've met Christ, then they're a holy person and they're worthy of the name saint. If I think of St. John the Forerunner, who was mistaken for Christ, they thought the iconography. We don't worship icons, you know, because we, we understand Exodus chapter 20, where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And one of the Ten Commandments is not to worship graven images. Okay, the big thing there is not the word image, ikona, icon, the word is graven. There's true images and there's false images. Well, what are false images? Well, false images are things that, that are not holy. It's the other things that I worship. It's like people worshiping money or worshiping status or worshiping power instead of worshiping the true God. People worship their physique. They oftentimes will worship their, even their sexual prowess, what they're doing with their body. But what we're asked to worship is God. How do we do that? We do that by, you know, people will see Orthodox Christians kissing icons. They'll say, see, they worship that. But we don't. I kiss my wife. I kiss my children. That doesn't mean I'm worshiping them. You know, I'm giving respect. So the difference really in worship is respecting things. We respect things that are holy, but we only worship God. We don't. I like that one, especially. Yeah, I kiss my wife. I kiss my kids. It doesn't mean I'm worshiping them. I like that. I never thought about it that way. You can go watch these two little uh, video clips uh, interviewing Father Maximus Constus, a monk from Manathos, and uh, wrote extensively on iconography. And he was interviewed by Father Josiah Trenum about uh, the theology of icons and why does our Christian art or iconography looks so different from Western sacred art, um, which seems to emphasize the more natural uh, earthly side. So you can go check those out for uh, on your own. Um, and this quote here from uh, St. Justin Popovich, just talking about that the incarnation is at the center of our theology of iconography. You can read that again on your own when I send the uh, the PowerPoint. So, um, as I mentioned, let me see here. 
Uh, okay. As I mentioned, there are nine ecumenical councils. A lot of people don't know about the eighth and the ninth, and some people even will um, uh, challenge or, you know, think that we don't really have an eighth or a ninth. But I'm going to show to you in just a second exactly what these are all about. So the Eighth Ecumenical Council took place in Constantinople in the year 7 or 879, 880 AD. And it has all of the qualities or the features of an ecumenical council. It was convened by Emperor Basil the Macedonian. It was attended by the entire church. Its rulings were in accordance with the teachings of the church. All five patriarchates of the time and the whole church throughout time has accepted it, including Rome. And that's also very important to note. Um, a divinely inspired Holy Father presided at the council and he explained the dogmas of the church. This was St. Photius the Great. And the council condemned two heresies, the filioque heresy and papal supremacy. Um, the interesting thing is that Rome, uh, the, the Pope of Rome and his legates, they accepted the decisions of this council for 200 years, for 200 years. So here you have, you know, it's very interesting that, you know, centuries later though, they would, uphold the filioque they would uphold people's supremacy but here for 200 years they denied that you know so very very interesting historical um to you know historical notes but again this has all the qualities of an ecumenical council so that was at the eighth ecumenical council the ninth ecumenical council took place in constantinople again and it was a really a collection of three small councils kind of back to back to back. These are called the Palamite Synods, perhaps you're familiar, familiar with, and it too also has all the qualities of an ecumenical council. Yes, yeah, and that's what this icon is showing. Um, there on the top, uh, the top uh, panel there is the Ninth Ecumenical Council. Same thing with the last one, top panel showing the eighth ecumenical council the fathers at that one and these two icons are by the way depicted at saint uh stephen's monastery in meteora um they were created or you know drawn over there so that's where you can find them in person um and again it has all the qualities of an ecumenical, ecumenical council the emperor convened it the whole church accepted it the whole church was there etc 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 um the heresies that it rejected were um the idea that god's grace is created um the idea that we cannot participate in god's light the glory of god <clears throat> and the idea that god's energies and essence are conflated that they're kind of not really distinct from each other and the rejection of hesychasm so these are all different heresies that the council uh condemned uh dogmatically saying that God's grace is uncreated. There's a distinction between God's energies and essence. Uh, we can participate in God's light. We can see God himself when we are purified, right? Because these hesychasts, like Singari Palamas, they were practicing hesychasm. And they were saying that they were seeing God, that they were seeing the, the, the Lord in his light. And this man named Barlam and others, they were saying, no, no, no this is impossible. We can't do that. Uh, and so Singari Palamas and many others were instrumental in hashing out our theology concerning those uh, those topics. All right, we're, we're going to, um, I don't know, do we need to take a, a, a break? I don't know where the night goes. It's, it goes so fast. We got, we start a little late too. Is this period when the SC cast happened? Yeah, yeah, in the 14th century, yeah. But there, there were many Roman Catholic saints that claimed to see Christ. Yes, um, the right, the the theology of Barlam, Akindindos, and others—they were saying that um, 
these guys were saying that uh, it's impossible. Uh, so um, there was that. And then they were also saying that the uh, that the greatest goal of Christian life is to uh, basically be philosophically wise, that philosophy is the highest goal in life or something like this. Um, so St. Gary Palamas, he wrote, uh, he wrote extensively about these issues called the triads. Um, in the triads, he hashes all of this theology out and he's responding to all of these claims and so forth. You can check those out. Um, a very new translation was just done recently by Father Peter Chamberis, uh, of the triads um and so you can check that out as well another very interesting thing i want to bring to your attention is that saint photius wrote this text here the mystagogy of the holy spirit he is writing he's responding to the filioque uh heresy and he defends our theology about the holy spirit in this text um and then saint Gary Palamas. Also, another very fascinating historical fact is that he also wrote, this is something that's not very well known. He also wrote um, about the filioque. He, you know, wrote extensively about how it's theologically erroneous. Um, and what's interesting is that this text was the very first text that Greece ever uh, committed to the printing press. So when Greece got the printing press in I don't remember what the year was, um, but when Greece got their very first printing press, the very first text that they ever typed up, basically, was this. Singari Palamas is, uh, it's called the uh, Apodictic Treatises, and he's showing that the Filioque is very problematic, theologically speaking, um, but tragically, um, the printing press then uh, got destroyed, I think, in a fire. Um, and um, so it's it's interesting because Singer Paul Moss is very well known for talking about hesychasm and things like this, uh, but he's not as well known for this particular text. But this was very, 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 very uh, well known back in those days. Um, and this is actually, as far as I'm well, uh, as far as I'm aware, this is the first ever English translation to have ever been written um and this was uh what's even more fascinating about this is that the individual who translated this i'm actually family with him uh he translated this like on the spot he did not use any resources there's the because the greek is so ancient and so outdated that it's very hard to translate and so he was very very well known or the translator was is very prolific uh, in his Greek. So um, you have the, in this text, you have the Greek on the left and the English on the right. Um, so very, very uh, great gift that has been offered uh, to the church. You can check those out later on. But um, the uh, these are some very popular texts uh, from, the, from the saints uh, about these kinds of uh, topics. So are there any questions, comments? Yeah. The Ninth Council reject? No, no, no. It upheld it, defended Hesychasm. Yeah. But um, Barlam, this guy named Barlam and others, they were rejecting Hesychasm. So Singari Palamas and the Holy Fathers at the Ninth Ecumenical Council, they were defending Hesychasm. Okay, so in parentheses, are the Yeah, they're rejecting the rejection of Hesychasm. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Hey, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's that's a really deep question. <laughs> Simply how I understand it. Mm. Jesus was God's only begotten son. Yeah. And you found the one called John, where he, Jesus is saying, I will go to the Father to send the Holy Spirit. Yeah. With me. So, 
talking about the Gospel of John. Mm. When it said, Don't be afraid, when I will be gone, we will be. You will not know who God has no orphans. I will ask my Father to send you mm -hmm. the Comforter, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, this is John's gospel. Uh, I think the uh, chapter is 15, chapter 15. Um, I went in, when I was in high school, I used to be very, very interested in these kinds of theological uh, differences between East and West, actually. Um, and um, um, I, it's been a while since I've studied this, the subject, so I can't give you a very deep theological uh response yet um but what i will say is the i would say one of the biggest issues is because it contradicts what christ says <laughs> in john chapter 15 verse 26 christ explicitly says that he says and i will send you the comforter this you know the holy spirit who proceeds from the father not from the father and the son so you know i've got to relearn unlearn the yeah roman catholic nicene creed I yeah i always stumble yeah when i was like reading this one yeah it's like oh yeah <laughs> you'll get it it just comes out yeah and, yeah and, so and when did rome kind of absorb a heresy mm. because they kind of made it, oh, I, I believe the issue was that the reason why this first became a thing was be in the West was because they were trying to confront Arianism. He was changed the book can just double. He like just changed some words and now yeah, we have more parishion. There was some some way theologically uh to confront Arianism. They thought that by something theologically it would be able to level it out and show that Jesus is actually God. I don't remember all the details of that. Um, so that that's one really, you know, one big reason. I mean, what else do you really need, <laughs> right? But uh, the theology is very deep. Um, and, and, you know, again, you can read these two texts. And really, these two fathers, I mean, to be honest, they don't really talk too deep. Really, in, on, in, all, in all honesty, they really talk pretty simply, and, and they talk very logically to show how it's theologically problematic. Um, so you can check those out. Um, but another thing why it's problematic is because uh, either at the second or the third ecumenical council, uh, the fathers said, you cannot make any changes to the creed. And that if you make any changes to the creed, you're anathema. So that's another reason why it's problematic because it's changing that which is not allowed to be changed. You know, um, but again, theologically, it's another topic for, or another uh, topic for another time. You know, it's very deep, but yeah. So John chapter 15, verse 26, that's where it is. He proceeds from the father. So this is um, this is some of the the uh, what we're looking at here. Um, any other questions or comments? All right, so let's let's keep going. Um, so this begs the question of what then is an ecumenical council? Because a lot of people have misconceptions, they're confused, and um, and so it's good to look at this. So this is on page three. I'm looking at the packet. Um, so um, this section, what constitutes an ecumenical council? So I will go ahead and read this little section for us. And here we go. There's much confusion about what makes a council an ecumenical council. So let us clarify the matter. A council is an ecumenical council primarily if, number one, if it is attended by at least one God-bearing Holy Father who is in a state of illumination, meaning that he has been totally purified of his sinful passions, he is filled with the Holy Spirit, he has unceasing prayer energizing within his heart 24-7 by the Holy Spirit. And as such, he is enlightened and guided by the Holy Spirit to teach and speak the truth and not heresy. Number two, 
the proclamations by the Holy Fathers concerning dogmas of the faith are not heretical, but they are in accordance with the teachings of the church, which testifies to the fact that the Holy Fathers formulating this, this theology were in a state of illumination. And number three, the dogmatic proclamations of the Holy Fathers are accepted and embraced by the entire Orthodox Church, either at the time of the Council and or throughout time after the Council convened. So an ecumenical council is primarily known for its character, uh, for its charismatic and dogmatic qualities. All right. Can I have a reader to read just a little bit of the next section? Anybody feel inspired to, to read, Matt or uh, Garrett? All right, let's go. Um, how to discern only false ecumenical councils. Let us debunk some common misconceptions in order to better discern true and false ecumenical councils. The council is not automatically an ecumenical council just because one emperor convened it, two, the majority of the church church bishops attended it, three, or even if all of the church churches patriarchates attended it. Additionally, these above external qualities are not absolutely necessary to make a council an ecumenical council. We know this because there were many oh, wow. councils throughout church history. We can point to which had many of these external criteria and the bishops attending the council even called such councils ecumenical councils but these were rejected by the church as false councils because they taught heresy in his monumental work the orthodox church not to call it the following importance the bishop is appointed by god to guide and to rule the flock Committed to his charge. At his consecration, a bishop received a special gift or charisma from the Holy Spirit, in virtue of which he acts as a teacher of the faith. But although the bishop has a special charisma, it is always possible that he may fall into error and give false teaching. Here, as elsewhere, the principle of synergy applies when the divine element does not expel the human. The bishop remains a man, and as such, he may make mistakes. The church is infallible but there is no such thing as personal infallibility. The same can be said about councils attended by several bishops. Just as individual bish bishops are not infallible, neither are councils of bishops automatically infallible. Indeed, councils of bishops can err and be deceived. How then, how then, one, how then can one be certain that a particular gathering is truly an ecumenical council and therefore that its decrees are infallible? Many councils have considered themselves ecumenical and have claimed to speak in the name of the whole church, and yet the church has rejected them as heretical. Ephesus in 449, for example, or the Iconoclast Council of Hyaria in 754, or Florence in 1438 and 9, yet these councils seem in no way different in outward appearance from the true ecumenical councils. What then is the criterion for determining whether a council is truly ecumenical? Well, perhaps no better answer can be found than the newly published book every Orthodox Christian needs to read on the reception of the heterodox, the patristic consensus and criteria. Therein, the authors state the mind of the church thus. True councils express the mind of the church and are led by bishops who have the mind of the church. The decrees of such councils are guided by the Holy Spirit because the bishops who lead the council are purified of the sinful passions and are themselves filled with the Holy Spirit. On true and false councils, the Metropolitan Hierotheos of Nocpactos states, the glorified saints, those who have been purified of the passion, have received illumination from the Holy Spirit, are deified, are filled with the Holy Spirit, clothed with the virtues, have the gift of unceasing noetic prayer in their heart, and therefore are led by the Holy Spirit, are the foundation and basis of ecclesiastical life. The glorified have authority in the church because they have acquired true and unerring knowledge of God. The people who follow the glorified have, have true faith. Since the glorified are authoritative teachers, when they assemble in local and ecumenical councils, they formulate the teaching of the church unerringly and with divine inspiration. 
Similar, similarly, Father Romanides says, the decisions of the ecumenical councils are infallible. During the ecumenical councils, the Holy Fathers were divinely inspired and made divinely inspired decisions about the dogmas of the church. Today, however, when noetic prayer is rare among the bishops, if a council of bishops meet, meets and they stand up at the beginning to sing together, heavenly king and comforter, spirit true, everywhere present and filling all things. Will the Holy Spirit come without fail and enlighten them? Simply because they are canonical bishops and assemble at a council and pray? No, the Holy Spirit did not act in that way with only these preconditions. Other preconditions need to be met. The one who prays must have noetic prayer already activated within him when he comes to the council in order for the grace of God to enlighten him. Those who attended the false councils were not in this state of prayer. The bishops of old, however, had this sort of spiritual experience and when they came together as a body, they knew what the Holy Spirit was assuring them of within their hearts on a specific subject. And when they reached decisions, they knew that their decisions were correct because they were in a state of illumination. This is the perspective from which we should view the virtue of obedience. We do not obey every teaching that comes along. We obey the glorified saints who have experience of God because in this way, obedience will lead to our own glorification. St. Theodore the Studite likewise taught that a gathering of bishops does not make a true council, but a true council is one that follows the righteous, that upholds the truth, and follows the canons. If there were many of them, for it is said, better is one righteous doing the will of the Lord than a thousand sinners. Uh, but an assembly in the name of the Lord for the sake of peace and the following of the canons in order to bind and loose, not as it happens, but as it should be, according to truth, according to rule, and according to true judgment. Father George Florovsky noted that ecumenical councils were not called such because they met specific canonical criteria. Uh, there were many false councils called that met the same canonical criteria, but rather for their charis charismatic character as being recognized as guided by the Holy Spirit. Indeed, those councils, which were actually recognized as ecumenical in the sense of their binding and infallible authority, were recognized immediately or after a delay, not because of their formal canonical competence, but because of their charismatic character. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they have witnessed to the truth in conformity with the scripture as handed out in apostolic tradition. As Metropolitan Callisto similarly writes, it is not enough to summon an ecumenical council. It is always necessary that in the midst of those assembled, there should be present he who said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Without the presence of Christ himself, however, however numerous and representative the assembly may be, it will not be in the truth. For orthodoxy, the sole criterion of truth remains God himself, living mysteriously in the church, leading it in the way of the truth. Christ is present in and through ecumenical councils by being present in his women saints that attend the ecumenical councils, thereby guiding them in, syner in synergy with their free will, of course, to make true dogmatic proclamations and thus rendering the council as truly ecumenical and binding on the church. Therefore, as it is clear, a council which teaches heresy cannot be an ecumenical council even if it is attended by a large number of bishops or by the majority of the church's bishops or even the emperor himself. A majority number does not entail they are on the right side of history. As the second hierarch of Brokor, Metropolitan Anastasius Grybanovsky once said, uh, it is known that the truth of the church is not always on the side of the majority. That's what to us during the times of Arian, Monophysite, and Iconoclastic Heresies. St. Saint, Saint Athanasius the Great and Maximus the Confessor not only remained in the minority compared to the number of heretics, but were also the sole proponents of purely Orthodox Church consciousness in their time. St. Athanasius the, the Great made similar remarks during the Arian heresy, where he was one of the very few canonical Orthodox Christians upholding the true of the faith 
whereas the majority of the church and bishops became heretics. This also means that just because a patriarch or even a council of patriarchs meets in council and makes some sort of decision or proclamation, it does not automatically mean we are to obey such decision or proclamation simply because they are bishops. For as we shall see later in the unanimous teaching of the Holy Fathers, if a clergyman or a group of clergymen, or even an angel from heaven, command us to do something or believe in something sim simple, immoral, unethical, or even heretical, then we are obliged to disobey them. Moreover, an ecumenical council does not have to be attended by the whole church at the time it is convened, nor by all of the patriarchates. Uh, this is proven by the second ecumenical council, which was not attended by the whole church since, since the patriarchate of Rome did not attend in any man. Nonetheless, the council is called an ecumenical council of the church because it meets all the necessary criteria of an ecumenical council as outlined above. One, its dogmatic pronouncements were embraced by the whole church over time. Two, it was attended by several holy fathers in the state of illumination. Consequently, three, the dogmatic pronouncements of the holy father, fathers made at the council were in accordance with the true teachings of the church. Finally, it appears that it is not necessary for a church to be officially called or ratified as ecumenical by a subsequent ecumenical council in order to finally become an ecumenical council. The erudite patristic scholar, Father John Romanides, who, amongst other things, was famous for helping contemporary Orthodox Christians return to the pronoma of the Holy Fathers after having been greatly westernized, writes the following. The current idea among Orthodox that an ecumenical council becomes finally official when it is recognized by a second subsequent ecumenical council has no basis in Roman law. Each such council became Roman law the moment when its minutes were signed on the spot by the participating patriarchal and metropolitan synods and countersigned by the emperor himself. Heretics and their heresy were condemned on the spot and not at a subsequent ecumenical council. Their creeds and heroi became Roman law on the spot. The creed of 381 AD became Orthodox creed on the spot in 381 and not in 431 at the Third Ecumenical Council, which simply repeated the creed of 381 as did each subsequent ecumenical council. This is further evident by the fact that not only did the Holy Fathers at the Eighth Ecumenical Council, for instance, call its council ecumenical numerous times, but so have many saints of the church called it ec ecumenical after it was convened, all thereby demonstrating the church's consciousness that an ecumenical council does not have to be absolutely called ecumenical or ratified as such by an ec a subsequent ecumenical council in order for it to be truly ecumenical. One wonders if perhaps this strange idea is a westernized influence since in Roman Catholicism, Ecumenical council become such only when the Pope recognizes it. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. I appreciate it. So a lot to digest there. Feel free to reread over that in your own free time. But yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions and and so basically the 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 basic line is that an ecumenical council is such because of its charismatic and dogmatic uh, features. Uh, that's really what makes it as such. Um, and so there's that. Um, oh, no. <laughs> no, the, um, uh, he's called that, that was a term that was given to him in the early church um basically because uh what was it yeah it was it's basically honorary essentially kind of it goes hand in hand with the idea of primacy like uh, he has a primacy of honor right so like when the bishops meet in the council he's kind of like the president at the council uh and he makes decisions in you know in cooperation with the other bishops but he's kind of like the at the head of the table so to speak but 
uh, primacy of honor, not primacy of authority. If that makes sense. Yeah. The term first among equals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, first among equals. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Tom. Yeah. Um, there's more to it, but that's pretty much the same. The simple answer. Um, I'll just summarize this next section, the purpose of economic councils. So you can meet it on your own time. Um, the fathers of the church, they're not, when they're coming together at an ecumenical council, they're not creating new teachings. They're not discovering new teachings, right? We do not have doctrinal development in the Orthodox church. We don't, we don't believe in that, right? Um, we believe that the fullness, the, the totality of truth had been revealed by Christ, right? Um, so there's no such thing as teachings being developed or, uh, you know, changing over time or being added over time. That's not, that's not an orthodox idea. So that's, that's just to clarify that. Um, we do not, the next section, infallibility, we do not believe in an infallible Pope. You saw that at the Council of the Apostles. There's no such thing as that. Um, again, you can look at this book to see the relationship of Rome with the other bishops throughout church history before the Great Schism to, to kind of show that a little bit more extensively. Um, but we do believe, as Orthodox Christians, we do believe in infallibility. We believe that Christ is infallible, obviously. And since the church is the body of Christ, we can simultaneously say that infallibi infallibility rests within the church, right? And so infallibility is expressed through the ecumenical councils. So the ecumenical councils are basically the, the highest authority for the, for the Orthodox Church. And we believe that the decisions made at the ecumenical councils, they were made under the guidance, the inspiration uh, of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, the decisions there uh, were infallible. They were without error. So that's also why the decisions, the proclamations at ecumenical councils are not subject to change. And they are binding on every Orthodox Christian at all times, everywhere. So that's another synopsis of that section. You can read that on your own time. Um, kind of moving on here. Um, the next section, again, I will just summarize. Um, I, I will maybe read a couple of these quotes here. Um, but so the, the question then becomes, okay, well, if there's a council, if there's a false council, right, uh, that teaches heresy or tells us to do something wrong, what's our response? Some people will say, well, you just have to be blindly obedient. But that's not the case at all, as there's extensively in this section, teachings from the Holy Fathers, many more I can provide, that tell us that we have to be discerning. Right? We have to know the teachings of the faith so that we can be able to respond to heresy appropriately. So if a council of bishops or just a single bishop tells us to do something that's sinful, wrong, heretical, whatever it is, we as Orthodox churches are obliged to disobey that heretical directive, right? Uh, because simultaneously in our disobedience to man, the sinful proclamations of man, we're being simultaneously obedient to Christ. So there is such a thing as godly disobedience or holy disobedience that's called for. Um, and you see that right from the bat with the 12 disciples, right? Christ tells them, go preach the gospel. But then the Jewish authorities come to them and they say, stop preaching. And what did the apostles do? Were they obedient? No, they said it is better to obey God than men. And that's why they they got thrown in prison because they disobeyed that uh, that order, which went contrary to the teachings of Christ. So here you have many holy fathers telling us that uh, that holy disobedience is something that we have to exercise from time to time uh, when the opportunity arises. So right here, St. Daniel Katanaki, I'm looking at the bottom of page 10. Uh, he says here, it's a modern day saint. I do not mean my ch children in the Lord that you should be blindly and irrationally obedient as some are to those who teach and supposedly assume spiritual authority for the sake, even if only slightly, of their ego and self-interest. No. 
but be careful. And if you see from us advice and counsels that are not consistent with the pure spirit of paternal discernment and the unerring prescriptions of the Holy Church Fathers, you should not obey, right? Uh, St. Justin Popovich, we must obey men in authority as long as they are not against God and the laws of God. However, once they stand up against God and his laws, the church must resist and oppose them. Uh, many other quotes from the Holy Fathers you can read on your on your own. Um, so yes, there is such a thing uh, as holy disobedience in the church. Uh, look on the next couple of pages, page 12 there, Blessed Metropolitan Augustinus of Florina, considered to be a second modern day St. John Chrysostom, very fiery preacher. He says this, the bishop must obey the gospel. This is why when the bishop is ordained, he is ordained under the gospel. As the fathers say, this means that the people shall, shall obey the bishop on one condition, that the bishop obeys the gospel. But when the bishop does not obey the gospel and does not do according to the holy canons, then the clergy and the people are not obliged to obey the bishop. We must obey God rather than men. In the event of a dilemma because of a contradiction between the gospel and the bishop's teaching, we must obey God rather than human beings. Everyone who finds himself inside that spiritual ship, which is called the church, is ob obligated to obey the bishop as long as he teaches in an orthodox way and performs his duties according to the Holy, holy Writ and sacred tradition of the church. All right, moving on. So another another misconception thrown around you'll hear unfortunately is this idea that okay you lay people right all of us you just have to blindly obey the bishops and the priests and if they tell you to do something that's sinful or wrong they alone will be held accountable by god uh but you will not be held accountable by god because you will simply be obedient that is not an orthodox idea this is not orthodox this is uh erroneous thinking um, again, we have uh, we have from the saints, again, on the next page, page 13, uh, from the Holy Apostles themselves, they tell us that, no, you will be, if you, if a bishop or a priest or your spiritual father or an abbot or the government tells you to go murder someone, and let's say that you go murder that person because I'm just being obedient, you're going to be held accountable before God for that as will the government or the spiritual father. You may not be as uh, held accountable as the person who gave you that command, but still you will be held accountable. So again, there's moments when we must uh, exercise um, holy disobedience. On the next page there, at the top of 14, this gets to the heart of it. St. Nikolai Vemiomovich, Serbian modern day saint, Here's what he says in the prologue. He says this, are the people to be blamed? Are the people to be blamed if the godless elders and false prophets lead them astray? The people are not to blame to as great a degree as their elders and false prophets, but nevertheless, they are to be blamed to a certain extent. For God also gave the people to know the right path through conscience and through the preaching of God's word. Thus the people should not have blindly followed their blind leaders when they led them on false paths and distanced them from God and God's law. Brethren, God is just and he knows the measure of everyone's faults and he will not permit the ignorant and the least to suffer as much as the learned and the great. O all seeing God, save us that we are neither blind leaders nor blind followers. Strengthen our hearts that as leaders and as followers, we will always be thy servants and only thy servants. All right. Uh, so again, you can read the other uh, more extensively on your own. Next section, again, I'm summarizing. I don't want to hold you up too much. Um, is sometimes we, another misconception, this idea that, uh, oh, it's just the duty or responsibility of the clergy to defend the faith. Actually, you and I, as lay people, we are responsible. It's our duty to defend the faith which means that we know the faith. We're constantly studying the teachings of the faith. Uh, when, if and when we hear something erroneously being stated, we have to speak up. We have to speak up uh, and defend the faith. Um, this is what the saints are saying throughout their writings in the next few pages. 
Um, and actually, what's also fascinating is uh, on page 16, Father Elder Athanasius Metalininos, uh, he actually says to us that if you hear a bishop or a priest say something heretical, it's actually your duty to go up to them and correct them. Uh, so, yes, laymen are equally responsible with upholding and defending the faith. Don't think that it's only the purview of the clergy. We're all co-responsible. Um, and finally, next few pages, I will summarize. Once again, you can read some of these quotes on your own. Um, where are we? Uh, bottom of page 17, right? So these ecumenical councils, the seven ecumenical council, iconoclasm, why is the church so concerned about heresy, right? We live in a very relativistic society. Choose, you have your choose. You do what you want, I'll do what I want, right? That's not really the mindset, the phronema of an Orthodox Christian. We believe in truth, objective truth. There is such things as truth and falsehood, right? So why were the Holy Fathers so concerned about heresy? Well, first off, this gets back to your question earlier, Ms. Rallis. What is heresy? First off, heresy is basically a false man-made teaching or practice. It's not what Christ and the apostles taught and passed down. A heretical confession or religion is therefore a false man-made religion. It's, it, it's uh, not what Christ taught. Uh, heretics or the heterodox are those who are members or adherents of a heretical religion or confession. Um, and they cling to heresies, false teachings and practices. And why is this important? Why is it dangerous? Why are the Holy Fathers constantly telling us to be careful with heresy? Why? Well, because first off, heresy is poison. St. Ignatius says that heresy poisons the soul. And as the fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council state on page 18, now at the top of page 18, heresy separates a person from the church, which means that when you're in heresy, you're not able to grow in theosis because theosis takes place within the church. So in other words, you cannot even begin the process of theosis if you're in heresy. So heresy is very dangerous. This is why Christ and the apostles like St. Paul again, and again, and again are emphasizing, hold on to apostolic holy tradition. Don't waver into heresy because of all of these harmful things that can take place on your soul. So this wraps it up. You can read all those pages we kind of skipped over for yourself. Forgive me. I wish we had the time to look over it uh, our, our, uh, in class, but there's a lot there. I, I uh, hope you can read in your own time what I've written. Uh, it was very fun to write. I like to write. Um, but all these, as you see, they're all connected to this Feast of the Sunday of Orthodoxy. Very important to understand in our day, full of relativism. And it's um, it's very important. And um, so are there any questions or comments? Please. Okay, I'm glad that Orthodox are trying. And I think there's still time to be, not just in, not in the face of iconoclasm, but from where I came from, the prosperity gospel. Mm. Your good father wants you to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you don't listen to Joe. <laughs> <laughs> <There was a. laughs> that was a good joke. Just... Joyce Meyer. She's... Joyce Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> she has she has the charisma. It's kind of like a modern day Tower of Babel in a sense. Someone well, someone told me that one time, and I thought, well, that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. Like an earthly utopia. So all the curiosity will fool one of these preachers. And you know what? He takes one sentence and goes on loop over and over with emotional roller coaster mm. and you can just hear one single message and i'm just going to use some psychological mass like more effect mm. in the media i guess because when you repetitive repeat stuff over and over it starts in your brain yeah 
and it's always it, the same stuff goes about advertisement. You yeah. Know, just put advertisement in the middle of something using all the psychological tricks for mm -hmm. people to be hooked up. Yeah. The same goes over just out of curiosity. If you never listen to him, mm -hmm. take one simple sermon. This sermon is very smart, and he uses just the uh, let's say the sharp keyboards mm. to reach your subconsciousness yeah. and you just listen like 10 20 times over 20 minutes with the same message broadcasting and then by the end of the message honestly i was quite mm. interested uh, like i had a kind of move yeah like emotional move okay, yeah i see it's interesting yeah. let's pull another one i pulled another one there is another message the same way the same way they broadcasting it doesn't give you actually the desire to dig deep, to right. check on your passions. Mm -hmm. It gives you definitely the desire, whatever is preached. He will broadcast you some information and you will swallow it. Yeah. Because it's lazy, like, lazy man, Christian. It's, it's, that's like people can make money on you because mm -hmm. you just don't resist whatever you, you fed, you mm -hmm. consume. and it, you don't care about consequences, how it affects you. Yeah. Well, and he didn't, from my knowledge, I researched the guy. Mm -hmm. He didn't complete seminary. So actual, like a formal pastor mm -hmm. slash priest education didn't. But he had lots of time doing the studio work for his father. Mm -hmm. His father was ordained. And he was the one that brought in the cameras for his father. Ah. Was he, uh, his father was the previous generation revival guy? Yeah, he, well, like oh. more of the Billy Graham kind oh, of era okay. back then. Okay. But kind of was with Billy and them were doing stuff. And then, hmm. yeah, now we're at the prosperity gospel. But hmm. then everything we do, I want it quick, I want it efficient. Yeah. You know, can Amazon please bring it in two hours? <laughs> you know? Right, and the Lord wants you to send one thousand one hundred dollars and fifty cents. Before. My grandmother was one. Of the, one of the, my grandmother was doing one of the biggest evangelical churches in California. Oh it's the gosh. Cathedral of Lux. It's a whole thing. That's on the tubes. Yeah, well, she was there. She was in Anaheim, like in the eighties, early nineties, and she's remained evangelical her whole life. But she said, "I knew how to get out of there." when the first mobile credit card readers, they were bringing them down the aisles. Wow. And this, oh, is, this, no is, and this is the early 90s. I mean, wow. they're pulling, they were pulling out all the stocks. Wow. And so, who was it that was running, known for running the, um, the Cathedral of Life? Yeah, they had a, they had a microphone. I don't know, I just know, I know Grandma went. Wow, that's crazy. Sure. Huh? No, no, it just went into bankruptcy or something, I think. Well, it's still standing. It's, I mean, just from architecture, it's... Oh, it's a beautiful... I think the Catholic Church... I think. Well, that's crazy. Yeah, I think you're right then. Huh. Well, well, you know, to to your comment, um, it's interesting. Father Seraphim Rose says that the people living in the end times will face psychological warfare uh and those who like overcome those that kind of warfare he says those, uh, they will be given um they will be awarded by christ uh as equally as much as the martyrs who shed their blood in the first centuries of the church i thought that was really profound and saint justin popovich says that the reason why we need to really really deepen um, the practice of the Jesus prayers because that is what will more than anything else protect us from psychological warfare. So very interesting. The tendencies are you go against it. Mm -hmm. Jesus prayer, you empty yourself into God. Mm -hmm. You make room for the logos. Yeah. And they can't manipulate. Right. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. Um, Father Sarah from Rose. And forgive me, it was not St. Justin Popovich. It was um, Elder Justin of Romania. Elder Justin of Romania. Uh, he is considered a saint. I, I think, yeah, I know he's considered a saint. I was going to say, I don't, I think his body is incorrupt, but I might be wrong on that. But 
definitely a saint of our times. I'll send you guys that quote. Very, very powerful. Oh, <laughs> Christ. Oh, he was, he was mentioning warfare. And so I used to be a football player. You got to figure out what your enemy wants against you. So our egos, ourselves, we're full of it. We're full of ourselves. You know, I want to do this. I'm tired. I want to go on vacation. I want to do this, that, the other thing. Well, with the Jesus prayer, from my understanding, and it's, this is kind of goes into like Hesse Chasm and such. Yeah. Jesus prayer, you really are, in a sense, crucifying yourself. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on you. You're not in control. You're not in power. You're asking your creator to have mercy on you. So as you continue this prayer of asking for mercy, you're not in control. You're going to start decreasing your ego. You're going to stop being full of yourself, in a sense. It's a form of repentance. Yeah. Right. Repentance and even humility. Mm -hmm. With St. Joseph, I forget. But if you only have one virtue, it would be humility. With that one virtue, you can acquire all the others. So as you empty yourself, going back to the spiritual warfare, the demons can manipulate you. The demons don't have any power over Christ. Think about when Satan was in the desert oh, no. trying to tempt him for 40 days. What did that put him? So as you empty yourself of the ego, you fill yourself up with the logos, Christ, through the Jesus Christ. And humility. But, yeah, go talk to the monks at St. Gregory and Palamas. They, they would be able to go even further and yeah. So. There's a monastery trip if you guys are, uh, if you're interested. Uh, Deacon Michael is um, organizing a monastery trip this coming Saturday to the St. Gregory Palamas Monastery um, to celebrate the second Sunday of Great Lent dedicated to St. Gregory Palamas. If you're interested, uh, get in touch with him. Um, but uh, that's what we're going to talk about next week is St. Gregory. This icon actually uh, has all the different uh, saints that we celebrate and the themes connected to them during Great Lent. So feel free to check that out. Check these books out if you want to talk privately, whatever. But uh, again, we'll see you next Tuesday then. So thank God. Yeah. Where is the monastery? Uh, Hayesville, down south, an hour south in Hayesville. Oh, west? Oh, okay, west. Yeah. Yeah. One hour there. Okay. Yeah, you have this number, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you want this number, let me know or ask someone else here, but yeah. All right. Well, all right. Well, good night then. Right.